Good evening and welcome to Greatest Somerville for January 22nd, 2019. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest tonight is a repeat guest here at Greatest Somerville, the state senator from the second Middlesex district, Senator Pat Jalen, who now has the official title of the assistant majority leader in the Massachusetts Senate. Well, we'll get our new appointments. <laughs> I like uh, the title well, already, so, though. Probably next month. And you are here to announce your candidacy for presidency of the United States. I, Since everyone else... The line else, is very long. The yes. line is very long, and it's getting longer these days, huh? Isn't that amazing, though? It is. It's it is. two it's, years, well, yeah, two years out, and they're starting to announce already. And they're all women. And they're all women. Not all. Well, officially announced. Julian um, Castro. Oh, that's right. Secretary, former Secretary Castro did announce that he is running. Yeah. So we still have Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, um, Cory Booker. Uh, we've got all these folks who are going to line up. It's a real danger, I yeah. think. So when are you going to announce? <laughs> I think the 12th of never, is that right? But the 12th of never, right. So Happy New Year. Welcome back to Thank Greater you. Somerville. Thank you. I what understand we both had soup parties this parties yes. this weekend. Yeah. Mine was a walk to. We were talking before. Mine the show. turned out to be walk to. <laughs> right. Usually people come from all over the district with the snow and the ice. So uh, lots of soup left over. Lots of soup. Yeah. Well, I wish I had chowder left over, but it's all gone. So welcome back. We're going to talk, um, Senator Jalen, a little bit about um, last year's performance, maybe for the district or Massachusetts in general. And then we'll move right into your favorite subjects that you're going to be working hard on in 2019. Okay. Before we get into that, I do want to say that if you need to get a hold of Senator Jalen, her staff, which I had the pleasure of meeting last month, earlier this last month. No, earlier this month. Oh, yes, because you came to the I met your entire house. staff terrorized your staff. They had no idea who this guy was. So um, thank you for that. Was but Matt it, there? At Matt and was Mark there? Because he's new. Uh, Mark was not there. Okay. Mark was not there. But if you need to get a hold of Senator Jalen, she's at the State House, and the phone number is 617-722-1578. But the website that they can get a hold of you. If they, well, the website is at patjalen.org. Right. And the good thing about that is you can sign up for my newsletter. And it doesn't come out that often, but I think it's pretty interesting. It's not, it, we don't make announcements usually, but we have analysis or sort of what I've learned about something. Right. So for example, my last one was about uh, updates on what had happened about bills that I had passed. Because sometimes you will pass a bill and nothing happens. So um, I, I reported on that. But honestly, the best way to get a hold of any of our electeds is go right to the email, send it in. You'll get a terrific staff. They'll get back to you. Eventually, yes. And most of, the, most of the time, I've been very fortunate. I think Senator Jalen thinks I have more power than I do. But whenever I've emailed her office or whenever I've called her, it's a response. Well, I think what we have more trouble with is people who are part of you know, 50 people send you the same email. Right. Those right. are not the top priority for us um, because we want to get back to people who have individual comments or, or requests, and often there are people who need help. Well, let me go back to the one national thing, and then we'll move right into your agenda. You got a prediction for 2020? Nope. Okay. And you heard it here first. She's not going <laughs> to say. So let's get right into it. You've got some, some things that we talked about briefly before you came on the show. You want to take them in any particular? Well, let me just say that I want to think, I think last year two important things happened in the legislature last, you know, last year. Um, the, the Criminal Justice Reform Act was a big deal. It had many, many provisions, including the five P bills that I had worked on for years. And uh, what I was mentioning about following up on them, one was medical parole for people who are dying in prison. We mm -hmm. have the oldest, the most old people in prison, aging in prison and dying in prison of any state. And we did touch on that the last time you were on the show. Yes, and, yeah. and now that was when, that was October, I think. It was back in the fall, right? And at that time, nobody had been released. Since then, one man uh, was released to go home to his mother, who is a hospice nurse. Mm -hmm. 
and he died a couple of weeks after he got home. So he was able to be but with her. But he was her. able to be with her. So that meant a lot to me. And we also, another piece that I wanted to check on was uh, people who have been wrongfully convicted, who have been spent uh, many, many years in prison uh, despite being innocent. And the first person got a settlement under that, um, under that improved bill, and that felt good too, to see somebody. But there are people still waiting, um, who've been waiting for over a year to get a settlement. Did any and of they the get out with no services from parole. Right, right. Because a lot of time, e even though they get out, they are disqualified from a lot of services, even if they apply for them, aren't they? I don't, they may have trouble because until they're formally exonerated, right. if they've right. just been let out, uh, no, they, they're still, they have to get exonerated formally. And, but then also they've been in, like, the man I'm thinking about has been, was in prison for 30 years. He didn't know how to use a cell phone. Right, <laughs> right. right. Um, so he, and he had, hadn't had to live independently. He didn't have any source of income. He didn't have the kind of education that would help him get a job. He didn't have, but he luckily has had a good community support network. But many of the people who get out won't have that kind of right. support. It's kind of out through the prison gates and you're on your own. Yeah. yeah, and I feel like you can put somebody in prison for 30 years who was innocent, you owe them something. Mm -hmm. That legislation, did it have anything to do with um, expunging from the records uh, a criminal conviction for marijuana use? That was actually in the um, marijuana bill. So that was p tied to the you marijuana can, bill. You can't have your record expunged except if you were convicted of trafficking, which is right. if you had 500 pounds that you were selling, that you can't have that expunged. And I think that confused a lot of people when, the fir when that announcement first came out, you know, that there were so many people who were wrongfully imprisoned for carrying a joint in the car. Well, they were accurately under the cur under that, that law, law at they that were time. Convicted. And now that it's legal, the corrective action that we're trying to say is that is not equivalent to trafficking 500 pounds of pot. And I think another important point is that we says in the uh, gaming industry, you have to have never been convicted of anything related to that. But in the marijuana industry, we want to give opportunity to people who were involved at a very low level or were convicted of just use. You've been on the show many times. You know once you give me a keyword, I give you a pop question. Uh-oh. The governor wants to legalize gambling. What do you think? Yes, no? Uh, online gambling. Online gambling. Uh, no. Okay. We'll go back to I yours. I think there's just been a court decision about that, too. I, that was something I saw come into my feed. So good luck with that, Governor Baker. Um, go on with your, so the agenda that you have uh, from last year, those are some of the things that, that you're proud of. The new stuff, I mean, it's, so, so for the, for the layman who's out there. Oh, and pay equity there, is now the law. pay equity, I was going to, yeah. That became, uh, we passed it in 2016, but it, it went into effect last year. Last year. And the first suit was by a flautist in the Boston Symphony. Turns out she's paid $70,000 less than the principal oboist who happens to be a man. So that was, that's the first suit that I know of, but uh, many companies around the state are re-examining their, their practices. And that was the most important thing to me is to make people pay attention. If you examine your pay practices and remedy any inequities, then you're immune to a suit. And that's what's causing people to pay attention. Right. Right. Um, one of the things that jumped out at me, Pat, was we had an incident here. And if, if you want to talk about it a little later, that's fine. But it's very close to home here in Somerville. It has to do with the event where a young woman approached um, the Cambridge Health Alliance uh, facility, the old Somerville Hospital, and she could not find the correct entrance because it wasn't labeled correctly. She went into an asthmatic um, event that eventually she died from. Do you want to talk about that bill? Because I think there's a lot of people who are interested in how to hold those types of institutions accountable. Well, I, th I think all of us who read the Globe story by Pete DeMarco were just devastated to think that right here in Somerville, 
uh, a woman could die within sight of people through a window, um, having gone to the marked emergency room at, that was locked. Uh, so I think that story has really moved people. Um, so Pete DeMarco is, uh, lives in Somerville, mm -hmm. and we've talked to him several times, and the two bills we filed in memory of Laura uh, one is to lift the cap on, uh, right now, the most he could recover would be less than the cost if he's filed a, a wrongful death suit or a, mm -hmm. um, that kind of suit. He would Some not, type of a negligence. It would yeah. not be enough to cover the cost of the lawyer. So we would eliminate the, um, the cap on tort damages mm -hmm. uh, for um, nonprofit hospitals and public hospitals. But the other bill is a preventive bill, and it would say that the Department of Public Health has to set standards and fines if they're not followed mm -hmm. for emergency department access. So, for example, there needs to be uh, video surveillance monitored. Mm -hmm. There was video surveillance, but it, no one was watching it. Right. Um, and a doorbell. So somebody at that desk has to be able to see when somebody approaches the emergency room yeah. doors. It's not saying the emergency room doors cannot be locked no. because they do those for security they reasons. Do. But somebody has to have eyes on that door. And there has to be a way for the member of the general public to alert somebody inside that they need to get in. Yeah. And it, it proper so signage, things like that. Sense. All the things that we learned not all the things, but the things we learned about emergency access, right. we're going to put in to ask DPH to have standards. I think it's a great bill. I think it's a great bill. It's not going to do Pete any good, to be honest with you, because he lost his wife. But I, I think, think he feels, I won't speak for him, but I think that we hope that having a sort of monument to her, that will help other people will mean a lot um, that her life and her death were not in vain, uh, yeah. Mm. You started to talk about one fair wage. Yeah, we just had a, a forum about that in East Somerville, um, and we had a good turnout. It, it, that, what one fair wage means that right now we have two minimum wages. We have the minimum wage of $12 an hour for most people, but tip workers are only guaranteed $4.35 right. from their employer. And then if, if they make less than $12, enough to make it twelve dollars they're supposed to be paid more by the by the employer that system um, good luck trying to monitor that system. It, it is not monitored there's a lot of wage theft I have met people just accidentally who've told me the that's not what happens you know most salaried people don't understand the concept of wage theft because oh. they go into a job paying, you know, seventy-five thousand or eight thousand dollars a year, it gets deposited once a month into their account, and they're happy. They don't understand that in the service industry there are some very unscrupulous practices that go on with wait staff or service industry folks. Even, I mean, I won't mention the hospital, but it wasn't in Massachusetts, but it was in New England that the company that was providing all of the maintenance services to this one major hospital in New Hampshire, that company had been found guilty of wage theft. And here was this major hospital doing business with this organization. So uh, one fair wage and wage theft. I, so I this would just make everybody paid the same. Paid the same. Same, and then if you made tips on top of that. Uh, there are people who make good livings as tipped workers. But most tipped workers do not, and they're much more likely to live in poverty. They're much more likely to be women. Um, they're much more likely to be on Medicaid. So we think, I think, and all jobs likely, should pay And most likely it's a part-time job, most likely. It may, and, yeah. and it's also, uh, you can't depend on it right. because your shifts yeah. change. It's, you bet. it's you good bet. for some people. You want to bring it down to... Um, Oh, but just one thing that gives us hope is one of the first bills the Democratic Democrats in Congress are filing would make the um, make one fair wage of fifteen dollars an hour for everybody in the United States, mm -hmm. and that would be the best because mm -hmm. then we're not raced to the bottom, 
and Race everybody. Right, and you know, there's, the monitoring of that system isn't as complicated when you have multiple tiers and multiple. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, I think it ties into it. You you help me. Is the um, uh, what am I trying? The working parents. Uh, it uh, goes back to well, uh, sort of kind of benefits so, and wages. The the working parents um, bill is one that Lee Erica Palmer, the uh, school committee member from Ward, Ward Three, three. Yep. Uh, brought to our attention that while you can use your campaign funds that you raise from your friends and constituents. You can use that to buy a tuxedo. You can use it to rent a car. Uh, but You're using you it can, for campaign expenses. Right, and right. you can take your, take your campaign workers to lunch, mm -hmm. but you cannot pay a child care worker while you're campaigning. Right. Um, so that passed the Senate last year. We hope it will pass uh, all the way this year. Yeah. It, yeah. It's an opportunity. It makes it more likely that women in particular, because they're usually right. the child care. I couldn't be in office at all if I hadn't had a friend who volunteered to watch my kids mm -hmm. when I first ran for school committee. Mm -hmm. It does make sense. You, you know, the, there are some things that don't make sense to me, but this one makes sense. It Good. makes sense from the standpoint, I was a former candidate. I know what the campaign finance laws are. I knew what I could spend my contributions on, but it always amazed me that it was so out of balance when it came to things like that that a woman who is usually the caregiver, the provider, could not go out and campaign unless she had a friend volunteering to watch the kids. Now it or gets, had a lot of money. Or had a lot of money to do that. Yeah, it does make sense to me. I'm sure I'm gonna get emails saying, well, why are you saying that? Why can't men do it? Well, Men can do men it. Men can do it. That's the equity that we're looking for in this world. So a male candidate for office if they have to pay someone to come in, they may be a widower. Their wife may work, right? Or they may be a single father. Or they may be a single dad, right? Or they may be a joint couple. So we have to get or out of that mindset. Or they could be two mindset. men raising children. My point, they, we have to get out of that mindset that that's okay for females, it's not okay for males, or con the converse of that. It's okay for males to do it, but it's not. Put it on the level playing field and then no one's gonna squawk. That's the way I would look at it. Will we hope? There you go. Um, let's bring it back home a little bit, the sewer bill. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this is something that is big. People don't understand why it's so expensive here in Somerville all the time, but we're constantly trying to fix 100 to 150 year old infrastructure problems. And this sewer bill that you, I, I think Representative Provost is in on this as well. Right? She and I have been working together on right. it. So if you want to explain it to the folks what this sewer bill does. Well, it actually doesn't fix anything, but it lets people know uh, when sewage is discharged into the river. So we got involved in it because of the Mystic, because mm -hmm. when people, people are beginning to use the Mystic more, but even if you're in your canoe or your kayak and you splash water on you or the, the rowing teams that are out on the river, uh, they can be out on the river when there is, have been sewage discharges from combined sewers, which we have uh, all over. And then in, in this bill got a lot of support because of the discharges into the Merrimack, which uh, sewage treatment plants were releasing hundreds of raw no, thousands sewage. of gallons right. of, of raw sewage into water that then became the drinking water and had to be treated for people downstream. Right. Or if they happened to be um, fishing or canoeing. Right. But as you say, it doesn't. So it would just just alert people. It doesn't if there was fix that. the problem because we have all cities that have that combined sewage. We haven't separated them in every community. During a massive rain event, you have to have a way of releasing the overflow that's coming in, and that is legal in Massachusetts. They have to meet a certain threshold. They can't do it every day, so they have a major event where the system capacity can't handle it. They're allowed to dump the raw sewage, it, whether it does, it's the it Merrimack just or the Mystic. They don't, they don't control it. Right, the it CSO overflows. in Somerville, the, the ones that come from into the Mystic, right. are just automatic right. because this, it's What this bill structural. does is it tells the general public, 
we're now required to tell you during that event we let raw sewage and I don't know if they're required to tell you how much but it's a way for the general public to understand that when you're using the waterways some could get polluted after a major mm -hmm. rainstorm mm -hmm. I like it well we're hopeful for I that like as it. well yeah I don't I don't drink the mystic so I'm fine with that but uh, good I idea do, I do boat on the mystic yeah um, the other one that I wanted to hear your thoughts about, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you know what it's like here on Greater Somerville. And I asked Representative Provo and Representative Barbara the same thing. They're going to close the Ball Square Bridge probably by the end of March. That's the latest. They originally had target date of February, and they moved it out to March 1st, and now it's the end of March. Your thoughts about what the two municipalities, because for those of you who don't know Senator Jalen's district, it's Cambridge, Somerville, Winchester, Medford. So the Ball Square Bridge in Somerville borders the two of those communities that are going to get hurt. Yep. My word. The businesses, the commuters, the bikers, the pedestrians, everybody's going to be inconvenienced by the closure of that bridge. Is there anything, any silver lining that we can look at for a year and say it's not going to be as painful? Well, the city uh, voted, the aldermen and at the request of the mayor voted to spend money to have a shuttle which will take people around so that people who are pedestrians won't have to walk as far. The traffic. This is I, all on the Somerville side. On the Somerville side. Medford going to do anything for their folks? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. But certainly advocating for people on particularly Harvard Ave uh, where there's a lot of truck traffic already and uh, the road is not in good condition. So we have been working with them on that. And then we have an issue around this MVTA had to reschedule all of their buses because it will take longer. And uh, the first thing that we learned is that the bus leave that East Somerville students would take to get home would leave right before they got out mm -hmm. of school. Mm -hmm. So we hope we've got a temporary solution for that. We're working on it. Yeah, I don't like to call those things nightmares until they actually are nightmares. It is a logistical challenge to continue to move people from the western part of the city to the eastern part of the city. And, and what I'm more concerned about, I mean, I'm still healthy. I can still get around. You give me a detour, I'll figure out a way to get around. My concern is mainly for the seniors trying to get from one part of the city to the other. There are, There is a major health facility right there at the Ball Square Bridge, mm -hmm. the dialysis center. And I'm concerned about students trying to get back mm -hmm. and forth from one end of the city to the mm -hmm. other, particularly the high school students. So mm -hmm. if we can figure it out and people are going to be inconvenienced for nine months to a year, you know how folks think. Well, yeah. when we were all rallying for the Green Line for many, many, many years, yep. we didn't think about all the trees that would be cut down and the dis disruptions not only at... at uh, well, on Broadway, found, but on Washington Street as well. Yeah, I found it interesting. I, I heard an elected official, not you, I heard an elected official say, you know, I've been working on this Green Line thing since for the past 15 years, and I thought to myself, I've never seen that person at a Green Line meeting. Maybe they were doing something behind the scenes. I don't know. Probably. But you and I, and we know who was there at the first few meetings, so we're fine with that. I did want to talk about um, the Green Line itself. Um, I can see it from my vantage point how fast this thing is progressing is moving. through the city. We have a major meeting coming up sometime in is late it, January. Uh, 30th? 30th. I think it's on the 30th. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's looking for the update on the Green Line stations, I think that's what they're going to be focusing mm -hmm. on is the Green Line Any stations. Any questions that people have. Right. And, you know, the, I, I happen to know some of the folks that serve on that Green Line. John Dalton, the manager, has been on my show. Those folks will stay as long as they have to that night of the meeting to answer any questions that folks have. And pe I think people on the working group are have asked people to send them questions so right. that he will be not able to say oh we we haven't thought about that let me get back to you we right. want to have the answers that night for right. people and i'll put a plug in for r2 the ball square representative on that green line advisory is jen dorsett and uh, ryan dunn is on the magoon square lowell street station side so give them a call too if you can't make the meeting one more time the email 
to get a hold of Pat Jalen's staff? Well, if you would send it to, you could send it to me, patricia.jalen at masenate.gov. It's at the Senate. If you, I mean, we're all. But go to my website. You can send an email through the website. Right. Um, I wrote down something here. The voting age, the voting oh, age okay. bill that. I have two bills that I filed because of Somerville and other students. Um, and actually both of these are, I think, well, this one grew out of um, the people who organized around the gun protest last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Big, sum, uh, or big Somerville leadership in that high school in students, that whole, high school students uh, organized thousands of kids across the state, um, and they are now working to try to lower the uh, voting age, to make it possible for municipality to change the voting age in local elections to 16, because mm -hmm. uh, they feel like they're pretty knowledgeable and They should have a engaged. say about the community they live in. So they have uh, asked us to file a bill to, lower, to make it possible for a city to decide to do that. And it's also, I saw, um, it's also winding its way through the Board of Aldermen, soon to be city council. So that would be a, yeah, that would be a home rule. Home rule petition for the Board of Aldermen to file with the, uh, with Beacon Hill to say, we want to be able to lower the age to 16 in our municipal elections. And that's probably the way it's gonna happen is individual communities will ask first. I'll put you on the hot seat. Any chance of it passing? I don't put anything past those students. <laughs> Excuse me. She's got full faith and confidence in the 16, 17, 18-year-olds. Well, I think they really did a fantastic job. That bill was not going to pass last year, the, uh, the gun safety bill. Yeah. And uh, they, they made it pass. Right. I, I'm going to give a shout out. I don't know if you're going to be excited. Sorry. 30, 30 seconds and I we're ready I'm to go. I guess I'm not going to. Give it the shout out. Well, student. Young women in three of the high schools in my district uh, petitioned and got uh, menstrual products offered for free in their restrooms so they don't get embarrassed and girls who can't afford them aren't even more disadvantaged. These are the so I'm filing a bill to make it about, happen. Men don't think about these things. So for the women who are running for office, the women who are in office, keep going. My, <laughs> mom, my mom would be so proud. I want to thank Senator Pat Jalen for joining me tonight, as always. Joe Lynch, Greta Somerville, stay safe, stay informed. Thank you, Senator Jalen. Thank we'll see you. See you next time. Okay. Yeah.